Okay, our next presenter is Dr. Beatrice Martin Perez. Uh, she is an associate professor in civil engineering uh, department at University of Ottawa. So before joining uh, uh, the university as a professor in 2002, she was a research officer at NRC working on mechanistic models of pavement structures. Her current research interests are on the effect of concrete deterioration with an emphasis on reinforcement corrosion, structural effect of structures, with the aim of integrating material deterioration models in structural assessment of aging infrastructure. So without further ado, Dr. Martin Perez. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, as I've been introduced, my name is Beatrice Martin, and I'm going to be presenting the experimental work of a former graduate student of mine, Samir Jabur. And I also want to acknowledge uh, the work of a uh, research uh, assistant, undergraduate research assistant, Arnova de Bunker. So, Concrete in general provides a very good uh, protective environment for steel um, because it has a high uh, pH uh, due to the hydration of, uh, of cement. But if we have enough chlorides coming into the concrete or carbonation of the concrete cover happens, uh, the passivity that naturally occurs uh, in steel within that high pH environment is broken and then uh, corrosion of the steel starts. Um, provided there is enough oxygen and water, um, that corrosion creates uh, corrosion products. Uh, they have a lower density and higher volume, and eventually they set the pressure around the reinforcing steel, uh, concrete cracks, and those cracks can develop, creating a spalling and the, the lamination of the concrete cover. So this is a phenomenon that we, uh, we see quite often in aging reinforced concrete infrastructure in coastal areas. Uh, we also see it in areas where there is a cold climate uh, due to the use of the ice and salt. So this is typical here in Canada. It also happens in the northern states where we use quite a bit of the ice and salts and that's a source of chlorides that can depassivate the steel. In Canada alone, there is estimated that we use around four to five million tons of the ice and salts per year. So that's quite a bit of a, of an amount of chlorides. It creates problems in in reinforced concrete that is not being designed to uh, have a, enough uh, large concrete cover or the material is not of good quality in terms of uh, low water cement ratio and high strength. So usually the problems are starting to occur on aging infrastructure that has been in server for at least 30 to 40 years. And I have an example here of reinforced concrete columns. The one on the left is a parking garage of a parking garage in um, Ottawa that was actually eventually demolished and uh, rebuilt uh, because the uh, membranes of the uh, slabs were not properly maintained. Uh, there was not good uh, drainage, and then there was leakage at the joints from one floor to the floor underneath. And you can see that there was quite a bit of leakage and eventually uh, corrosion of the reinforcement of the sustaining columns underneath and uh, spalling the lamination of the concrete cover. Here on the right, we see a bridge pier also. This is a, a bridge pier and an overpass in Ottawa as well. Uh, bridge piers, they tend to deteriorate on the side that is exposed to the traffic. And usually, uh, the area of deterioration is the splashing region uh, where the cars pass by and they just splash um, water that is laden with uh, the ice and salts. And in this case, uh, the entire uh, concrete has delaminated. And of course, once that the reinforcement is exposed, the corrosion process proceeds at a much faster rate. Now, in general, the process of corrosion of steel in concrete is idealized as a two-stage process following an idealized model by uh, Tutti, who was a pioneer in the studies of uh, reinforcement corrosion in concrete in the early 80s. And it, uh, what it uh, idealizes is the process of a two-stage, an initiation process where either chlorides penetrate the concrete cover or uh, carbonation of the concrete um, happens, and then the onset of corrosion occurs. This is a period that has been quite a bit researched, and there is a lot of literature and studies uh, studying the process of either carbonation or chloride diffusion into concrete. And once corrosion starts, uh, there is the ensuing cracking and spalling or the lamination, depending on the stage of damage. Um, there has been quite a bit of uh, studies more at uh, the small reinforced concrete samples that large structural elements on the effect of reinforcement corrosion on cracking and spalling on the concrete cover. And now there is more um, 
focus on the actual uh, or the potential to cause failure, especially on, on, on structures that had been in service for a long time. Now, there has been quite a bit of a study in the last 20 years on this propagation period, uh, particularly on flexural members, but there hasn't been uh, that many studies on reinforced concrete columns. But the few that they are out there, uh, they, um, they observe that there is a reduction in the axial bearing capacity of the columns uh, due to the addition of low eccentricity because of non-uniform corrosion on the longitudinal reinforcement, as well as when the concrete cover spalls and delaminates, uh, the loss of concrete section creates that eccentricity as well. Uh, Backlin of the longitudinal reinforcement if there is corrosion of the ties as well as the deterioration of the concrete section from loss of confinement and, cr and cracking or the spalling and delamination of the concrete cover. So this motivated the study that I'm going to present today. Uh, we wanted to study the effect of reinforcement corrosion on cover cracking as well as the bearing capacity of short columns, but a little bit departure from previous studies as we wanted to corrode our specimens while they were sustaining compressive load. So uh, we built 10 uh, columns, eight of them were corroded, two were controlled. Uh, we apply a constant service load through the process that they were being corroded. Um, we simulated the corrosion process uh, using an accelerated corrosion scheme. We monitor the crack propagation and measure crack widths. And then at the end of the period that uh, uh, we consider that damage was uh, or, or the one that the, the level of damage that we wanted to obtain, we tested uh, six of those columns that were corroded, plus the control ones um, to failure. Some of them were concentric load, and some of them had a little bit of eccentricity, in, um, uh, sustaining a little bit of bending moment as well. So the test specimens were circular, 260 millimeters diameter. They were uh, reinforced with uh, six. 15M bars longitudinally, and then they had a spiral reinforcement of uh, uh, 10M. Uh, the clear concrete cover was 20 millimeters, and there were two types of specimens, what I'm going to call type CV, uh, that had the uh, spacing between uh, the spirals, so the pitch spacing was uh, 220 millimeters. This is actually a uh, much larger spacing that the code, that the Canadian code requires. And the reason we wanted to increase it was to uh, see um, we didn't want our column to be confined. In this case, we just actually mm, corroded the longitudinal reinforcement. Uh, the design axial capacity was 1,500 kilonewtons. And the other type of columns that we had, so we have five of CV and five of, uh, of CS. The pitch was 80 millimeters, which corresponds to the minimum confinement provided. And uh, we calculated the second peak due to that confinement as uh, almost uh, 2,000 kilonewtons. Now, the materials used, um, they had a wa high water cement ratio because we wanted to achieve corrosion damage in a shorter period of time, within 10 months. So the water cement ratio was 0.6. I realized this is a little bit higher than what it would be required today for these type of elements uh, exposed to a chloride environment. Uh, we also mix with the mixing water 3% of sodium chloride to accelerate and trigger the corrosion process. And the uh, Compressive strength at 28 days, uh, the average compressive strength of concrete cylinders that were casted at the same time was 27 megapascals. The yield strength of both the longitudinal and spiral reinforcement was 400. So here you have a look at the specimens. We actually place uh, steel caps at the bottom and top of the specimens because we wanted to induce the damage in the middle of the column. Uh, those uh, steel caps were actually uh, coated with uh, zinc uh, paint so they wouldn't corrode. We uh, cured the specimens with moist burlaps and wrapping plastics for 14 days, uh, make sure that they uh, had a proper curing. And once that they were uh, cured, uh, we subjected to uh, sustained loading. Uh, the, this is the setup that we use for uh, the sustained loading. We had uh, two steel plates at the top and at the bottom uh, that they were connected by 25 millimeter steel rods. Uh, that were subjected to tension and they were applying compression to the specimens. Uh, the column was placed in between uh, those plates and there was a, a 16 millimeter thick um, 
a round plate in between the plates and the, co the steel caps of the columns um, that was a, that was welded to the outer steel plates, but was just uh, connect was touching uh, without a, a bond connection to the steel caps of the columns to allow for pin connections. Now, the steel roads were subjected to 55 kilonewtons uh, tensile force. This was monitored throughout the entire uh, process, and this amounted to 220 kilonewtons uh, sustained axial compression, which represents around 20% of the design capacity of the columns. While they were sustaining load, they were subjected to an accelerated corrosion regime, so the longitudinal or spiral reinforcement, depending on what type of columns we were corroding, uh, were applied a constant anodic current. Throughout the process, the current density that we targeted was around 250 to 300 microns per centimeter square. Uh, we had to place stainless steel sheets outside the columns. You can see them around here to act as counter electrode. There were four per each column at each opposite size of perpendicular diameters. And we also, instead of submerging the elements in, um, in water or in a sodium chloride solution, what we did was to wrap the uh, specimens with a perforated hose and we would apply a wet and dry cycle at um, uh, frequent intervals. So as I mentioned, Half of the columns uh, had the longitudinal reinforcement corroded, some of them for 10 months, some of them for four months. Um, the CS uh, type of columns had the spiral reinforcement, and then there were one of each types where the entire cage was uh, corroded. When we wanted to corrode just only the longitudinal spiral reinforcement, we had to isolate the reinforcement. So for the uh, CV type columns, we use a shrink temperature tube to isolate the spirals from the longitudinal reinforcement. Uh, for the ones that we were corroding the spirals, we actually use uh, electrical tape at the point, contact points along the reinforcement. We had LVDTs uh, to measure the deformation of the column. We also had the strain gauges at the steel rows that they were applying the uh, sustained load. Uh, one LVDT at mid height of the column to measure the uh, circum circumferential expansion. And then we were taking measurements every three weeks for the period of four months or 10 months, depending on the column. So this is the cracking after the period for each of the columns. For columns where the longitudinal reinforcement was corroded, it was very clear uh, that uh, cracks were forming along the longitudinal reinforcement. You see bigger cracks for those that were for a longer period than a shorter period, but in general, the cracking pattern was uh, uh, typical of longitudinal um, or following the direction of the longitudinal reinforcement. For uh, columns that were just only corroded the spiral reinforcement, the cracking was a little bit more random, but it usually follow uh, the direction of the spiral. And we will see with the measurements now that the cracking was actually much smaller. So here is the longitudinal crack width for the type CV columns versus time. And we see that the uh, specimen that had the highest crack width at the end of the period. The testing period was that that had the entire cage been uh, corroded. Uh, but early on, uh, they all follow the same trend of uh, growth of crack width with respect to uh, time. When we look at the other specimens, just only the spiral reinforcement was corroded. If we look at the magnitude first of the crack width, we can see that it's much smaller. So longitudinal cracking was six to eight times greater in the CV specimens than the CS specimens. And uh, in spite of, we are going to see later on that the mass loss was similar. So we believe that this is one of the effects of uh, sustained loading because uh, the CES specimens, they experienced cracking that it was perpendicular to the load. So the load actually helped keeping those cracks smaller. Uh, we calculated what would have been the theoretical mass loss uh, over the period of time that they were tested based on Faraday's law. One of the problems, Faraday's law assumes that the entire current is being used for corrosion. There is no losses. And based on that, we could clearly see that there was an increase of crack width uh, with mass loss. And obviously, for the uh, CS specimens, the specimens that had just only the spiral reinforcement corroded, the crack width was much smaller, uh, which would believe is the effect of the sustained loading. <laughs> 
Uh, color deformation over time is actually similar in both types of columns. It's just the rate of increase of that deformation over time uh, differs. So when we look at uh, the, the specimens with the longitudinal reinforcement being uh, corroded, uh, the rate of increase of deformation is greater at the beginning, whereas for the other types of columns, it tends to increase at the beginning for the first two months and then it stabilizes and it uh, increases again after a period of time. Once that we subjected the specimens to corrosion, we actually uh, test them to failure. So this is the setup that we use uh, for, um, for testing them. Uh, the columns were actually being loaded by this uh, beam up here that was connected to the strong floor of the structures lab through four 38-millimeter uh, steel rods. And uh, we apply some tension on one side of the uh, column, subjecting the column into compression, and the other side of the rods were used to stabilize the system. And by uh, tightening the nuts of the rods on one side or the other, we could actually control uh, the amount of um, eccentricity and bending moment applied to the column. These are the results of the columns that were tested. So if we look at the uh, first four uh, rows, uh, the first one is the control, and then the next three are the ones where the longitudinal reinforcement was corroded. We can see that the axial capacity of those uh, columns was much reduced, and the deformation was also increased. In general, the failure type was brittle, uh, with uh, crushing of the concrete and buckling of the longitudinal reinforcement. And for the other set of columns, we actually observed that they were able to keep the confinement in spite of the loosening of the concrete cover at reaching the first peak, and their failure was actually quite ductile. The only, the, the only case was the last one, which we believe is not representative of what happened because uh, there was a lot of deformation when attaining the second peak, and um, we believe that that deformation had to do with yielding of the beam that was actually transferring the load. So we don't consider that as a very representative of the other three specimens. These are pictures of the failure um, types of the columns. So you have the control one here for the longitudinal reinforcement. Uh, this one is the one that the entire cage was corroded after uh, 10 months. So you clearly see a spirals rupturing and backing of the uh, longitudinal reinforcement. And um, these are the other two of longitudinal reinforcement being corroded. Again, this uh, also had a brittle behavior uh, with uh, backing of uh, longitudinal reinforcement. This is the case where the spirals were corroded. So we have here the control one. We had a typical failure with uh, concrete spalling at reaching the first peak, but was able to sustain the second peak, uh, keeping confinement. And the other columns were able also to keep uh, and attain the second peak uh, confinement was a 10, and we believe it had to do with the fact that longitudinal reinforcement was not corroded and was also provided some confinement to the column. Although you can see that there was a little bit of, uh, I just want to show, I don't know if you can appreciate, backing of the longitudinal reinforcement on these specimens uh, after attaining the second peak. And these are the other two types of columns. So I have plotted here the results versus the design uh, load um, moment direction diagram. And we can see that those columns that were actually corroded uh, along the longitudinal reinforcement, uh, they failed uh, in a region where they were supposed to be safe. So uh, uh, that this is a problem here. Uh, however, for the other columns, we observed that the confinement was uh, kept up to the second uh, peak. And uh, even though the spirals were corroded, it did not affect that much the concrete, the column behavior. Uh, after the test, we retrieved some reinforcement samples, and we actually conducted gravimetric analysis according to the STM G1, uh, which basically is just taking samples, reinforcement samples, subjecting them to a chemical bath to see what is the weight after uh, corrosion products have been removed. And what we see for the uh, first series of columns, 
is that even though only the longitudinal reinforcement was corroded, we observed that the uh, spiral reinforcement was corroding as well. Um, we don't know if the electrical connection or uh, isolation that we provided was not good enough, or the fact that the spirals are closer to the outside, and because we were subjecting to wet and dry cycles, and there was a chloride already in the concrete, they corroded. And uh, However, for the samples that just only the uh, spirals were corroded, uh, we observed that uh, the isolation was better and the, um, these are the levels of mass loss that each um, spiral, or it's an average value of the samples. <coughs> we plotted here the mass loss against the crack width with an intention of trying to see if there was a relationship between the growth of crack width and mass loss. And the reason is because we cannot, when we are assessing a structures, we cannot and take samples to actually measure how much uh, uh, corrosion products have formed. Uh, so perhaps we could assess the level of uh, mass loss um, due to uh, crack width. But we saw that there was not a clear tent. And then here you have the actual um, relative ratio of the corroded uh, bearing capacity versus the uncorroded columns. And as you can see, the ones that were confined, they were able to keep their capacity up to the second peak. But those that were unconfined, they lost uh, between 30 to 40 percent of the bearing capacity. So in conclusion, the cracking pattern was different in both uh, types of columns. The one with the longitudinal reinforcement corroded, the cracking pattern was longitud longitudinal parallel to the steel. And it was the crack waste ensuring from that corrosion was six to eight times that of transverse cracks in the other types of columns. Uh, the failure type of column CV was uh, brittle uh, with uh, sudden crashing of the concrete and longitudinal buckling. And the columns with uh, type CS, which were confined columns, uh, were able actually to perform quite well and keep um, uh, attain the second peak of uh, strength even though the spirals were corroded. Thank you.